You're listening to Pele Tenebris Radio, part of Fight the Lies Radio on the Cast Off Ministries Network. Good afternoon and welcome to Pale Tenebrous Podcast. My name is Kelly and this is episode 5. As always, I am very happy that you are listening to me today, that you are here with me. I wanted to make a quick, off the top of my head, podcast concerning having faith in the Lord and going through times of grief and times of uncertainty. I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the most tragic events that's happened to me, and that was the death of my mother. This is a little bit hard for me to talk about. She passed away on my 14th birthday, and without fail, every year, I'm transported back, and I remember everything that happened, whether I want to or not. I decided to record this episode because we found out today that our Jack Russell Terrier, Sprite, uh, he's 11 years old, and he has cancer. And this has hit us hard because we were hoping for a few more good years with him. This has really hit us hard. I think it's taking time for this all to really sink in. We have opted to give him a couple of medications, one that's going to shrink the tumor and another one that's going to help with his pain. And the vet said this should give him about three to six months. And we're faced with the inevitability of not having this happy, energetic, sometimes grouchy, and often very vocal dog with us. When you've had a companion with you for a long time, it it hits you hard. And it's, it's hard to face the death of someone that you love, the death of a beloved little furry four-footed friend. And so to go back to the time that mom died, she had a brain aneurysm about three days before my birthday. She hadn't been feeling well prior to that. And in the span of about six months, almost a year, she had been in and out of the emergency room getting sick. And it seemed like she wasn't getting any better. She was really refusing to take proper care of herself. And we lived in this little apartment complex that was just down the hill from a nursing home. And when I would hear ambulances go by, uh, going towards the nursing home, I got into the habit of praying, praying for the person that they were going for and for all the EMTs, and as well as the doctors and nurses who would be treating and helping the person who had either become injured or very ill. And to this day, it's a habit. So one night, um, the sound of a siren penetrated my dreams and, and I went back to sleep and not even a minute later, my stepdad was hammering on my door, opening it and telling me to get up and get dressed that mom was going to the hospital, to the emergency room. And I just hadn't connected anything yet. And I thought, well, this is for, you know, maybe she's just become really sick and she needs to go. So I got dressed and I opened the door to my room and I looked down the hallway and mom was staggering down and she was holding on to my stepdad. She collapsed onto a chair in the dining room and went lifeless. And at that moment, I absolutely knew this is extremely serious. So the EMTs came in, they got mom's heart started, loaded her into the ambulance and my stepdad went off with them and I went across the hall to where my pastor and his wife lived and they were also my mom's very close friends and they were also my godparents. So I waited there with them and I had my Bible with me and I was just reading it and just feeling numb and terrified and not knowing what's going to happen and just silently pleading with God for everything to be okay. So when we got the message that we could go ahead and come on to the hospital, my godparents drove me there and we went to the ICU. Mom was lying on this bed, just hooked up to so many monitors and machines and IVs. And she had a breathing tube down her throat to help her breathe. And I found out that 
On the way to the hospital, her heart had stopped again, and the EMTs got it started back up, and then when she got to the hospital, it stopped a third time, and they had to work for quite a bit of time to get her heart started again. And this is me saying thank you to all the emergency medical technicians who put yourselves out there every day, who have to see and deal with things that we could not imagine. Thank you so much for what you do. And I wish I could tell those EMTs who helped mom, I wish I could tell them you did your best, you did what you could, and I cannot thank you enough. So mom was in a coma for about three days. And in this time, I spent quite a lot of time in either the hospital's chapel at mom's side or in my room at my grandparents' house, just pleading and begging God, please save mom's life. Don't let her die. Because I didn't know what would happen. She wasn't getting any better. She was starting to decline fairly rapidly. And finally on my birthday, after a somber, I can't even call it a birthday party, just a somber gathering of family and Okay, it just got interrupted by a plane. We live near an Air Force base. uh, Not an Air Force base. We live near a naval air base, and so I had to wait for the plane to finish doing what it was doing before I could continue. So after this somber gathering of family and friends on my birthday, my grandparents' next-door neighbors, just absolutely wonderful people, and I will never forget them, and I will never forget this kindness. Their son and I were good friends, so they took me to their house and talked to me and told me, you know, you're going to have to take your mother off of life support. She can't continue like this. She's, you know, basically almost brain dead, so you're going to have to do what's best for her, and I didn't want to do it. My family was not going to take her off life support until I gave my consent. So after talking with me, I realized that they were right, and I didn't want to, and I said, okay, we'll do it, and we were going to do it the next day. So that night, I tried to prepare myself to say farewell, and I believe to this day that mom was holding on for me, and she was just waiting for me to let go of her. That's the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. So I was sitting at the kitchen table in my grandparents, the house, the, the layout, The den was right next to the kitchen. You could just walk right over, right next to each other. So I was sitting at the kitchen table watching Meet Me in St. Louis, which is one of my favorite musicals, and eating a ham sandwich. And my grandfather called from the hospital. My uncle answered the phone, and he put the phone down to his chest. And I could just tell by the look on his face. He said, she's gone. I ran to the bathroom and threw up. And the days following, I can barely remember because I just, there was so much going on emotionally, so much turmoil. And this hit me hard, and I felt so betrayed by God. You know, I've prayed to you, and I've cried out to you, and you didn't listen to me. And this is because I had been taught that God always answers our prayers, and He's always in control of every little aspect of our lives. And... I don't think that way now. I don't believe that God is in complete control of us because if he was, then we would not have free will and we would not have the freedom to make our own decisions. And the decisions that we make either have good consequences or bad consequences and we need to learn to face those consequences. So for a while, I, my anger was just burning so hotly inside me. I rejected God. I didn't want anything to do with him. I didn't want to do anything with Jesus. But honestly, deep down inside, I knew I hadn't given up on him completely, and I knew that he would never give up on me. In 2006, my grandmother passed away. And just two days after my, yeah, two days after my 18th birthday in 1998, my grandmother had a stroke that paralyzed her left side. And she ended up having to be placed in a nursing home. It was a very difficult decision for my poor grandfather, but I stuck around with them because I wasn't going to leave my grandfather alone. And as the years progressed, I noticed that my grandmother just didn't seem like she was herself, even though she was confined to a bed because she completely gave up. She had gone through so much physical therapy to be able to walk with the aid of a walker and 
to regain the use of her limbs, but she just gave up. She couldn't garden anymore. She couldn't cook or clean or do any of the things that she loved, and, and that really took a toll on her. And she just didn't seem the same. And I kept after the doctors and my grandfather saying she's, she's not, something's not right. She's not herself. And then it was found in February of 2006 that she had Parkinson's disease and she passed away four months later. In September of 2005, I just got this very strong feeling that my grandmother was not going to live past the second half or even the first half of the following year. And when we found out that she had Parkinson's, I made a trip to visit her and my grandfather, and my grandfather had become very ill as well with emphysema and congestive heart failure, and he was in assisted living just down the hall from my grandmother. So I got to visit them both and talk to my grandfather and say, you're going to need to let her go because I have a feeling her time's coming. And he knew it, and he said, I don't think I can let go yet, and I said, just you don't have to now, but you're going to have to eventually. And it was just so strange to have this role reversed. And it took me back to when mom was in a coma and my grandfather talking to me, trying to convince me, this is the best thing to do for your mother. You need to let her go. And so just in the days before my grandmother passed away, I was in school studying computer network management. I was in such turmoil because my car was in the shop for repairs and I didn't know if it was going to be ready to go before my grandmother passed away because I just knew I needed to be there with her. And when, after I had talked to my grandfather, I went in and I told my grandmother, I said, I know you know your time is coming and I want you to know that I'm okay. I'm taken care of. God is taking care of me. My husband has taken care of me. Everything's going to be okay. I'll be okay. But when you feel the Lord calling you home, you go ahead and go home. And through so much prayer, after so much prayer, and telling the Lord, if I make it, it's okay. If I don't, it's okay because I know she's going to go home to you. We got the call that my car was ready. Went and picked it up. Got all my stuff packed. The next day, we headed out. And I confessed that I was speeding. And this was about a six hour drive to where my grandparents were. We got to the nursing home. I shot out of the car, ran up through the halls to her bedside. And my uncle and aunt and two of their kids were there too. We were all gathered around her. She was unresponsive. She had stopped eating. She had been declining very quickly. We were all there for a few minutes, and I said, if y'all don't mind, I'd like to have some time alone with my grandmother. So everybody left the room, and I knelt down by her bedside and took her hand and said, Mima, it's me. You can let go now. You don't have to stay here for any of us. And my uncle came back in the room, and he took a look at her, and he ran and grabbed everybody. And moments later, with all of us by her side, she took her final breath, and her spirit went home. And I was always very close to my grandparents, so, so very close to them. And in 2008, my grandfather had one final, very, very bad attack with his emphysema and his congestive heart failure. And he had moved to Marietta, Georgia to be with my uncle and aunt, to be near them. And this attack left him on the floor, hallucinating and calling out for me and my grandmother. And this just breaks my heart because I had never wanted this for any of them, especially my grandfather. We were so very close, and I did not have the strength to fly down to Georgia to be with my grandfather in his final moments. But what I did do was call. My uncle put the phone up to my grandfather's ear, and I told him, I said, Peepaw, I'm happy, I'm healthy. I just got a job with a good company. And I just want you to know I love you. And I couldn't do what I wanted to do because I did not want him to hear me cry. I did not want that to be the last thing that he heard. And I was at work when we got the call that he had passed away. And I came so close to fainting. It was so painful. And it's hard to see that someone that you love is sick 
and knowing that you are completely powerless to do anything, you do not have the power to heal them. And if you could, you would take all their pain and suffering upon yourself just so they could be happy and, and healthy and, and live a good, fulfilled life. In the years since my grandfather passed away, there have been other family members that have passed and it's hard. And my precious and wonderful godmother passed away last October and you never get used to this. Each passing just hits hard. It's as if Thor has taken Mjolnir and just slammed it into your chest. You're left breathless and afraid and wondering how you can continue on without these precious people in your life. But it's possible to. You can do it. And in these years since coming back to the Lord in 2005, I have experienced times where I have had to allow myself to be content with the outcome that I know is going to just bore a gaping hole into my heart. And I I can't tell you how rough it's been, but at the same time, it's just strengthened my faith even more. In Psalm 46, 1, these beautiful words, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. But when we think that God is always in control of everything and that he is going to give us everything that we want, that he's going to heal every illness, every injury, we have to allow ourselves to come face to face with the reality that this is a fallen world. Our bodies are not immortal like Adam and Eve's were before the fall. We face sickness and death and uncertainty every day. What we need to understand is that there's going to be sickness in this world and there's going to be death and that God knows what he's doing and we cannot understand his ways for his ways are not our ways. They're incomprehensible to us. But we have to come to be willing to understand and to learn that he always has our best interests in his heart. And we might think that we know this thing is good for us when it's really not good for us. And Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. That's from Romans 4.20 and 21. And that's a beautiful verse. That's a beautiful scripture because this is what I've had to learn. And I know the promises that God has given me. And I rely upon him and his love and my faith that no matter the outcome, he's going to have me in his hands and that he is not going to let me down. For surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's from that beautiful psalm, Psalm 23. And again from the psalms, my comfort and my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. That's Psalm 119.50. And that is very true of today. We have comfort in our suffering and knowing that the Lord's promise that he fulfilled with the coming of Christ and his sacrifice to wash away our sins, and that precious blood preserves our life. Because to me, death and hell are eternity without the presence of my God, my Father. But life in heaven, that is an eternity with him, and that's the eternity that I look forward to. And that what helps in these times when faced with such sadness and such grief is the knowledge that I'm going to see my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my godmother, my family again in heaven. And I know this with absolute certainty because every single one of them were saved and they had such incredible faith and they were such an inspiration to me. An inspiration that I hope I could fire up in just one person. To be able to inspire and to give hope and to be such an example of what it is to be a Christian and to have faith 
that is so unshakable that those around you will be encouraged by it. That is a great hope of mine. And I am so sorry that this podcast is a downer, that it's sad, but I wanted to share this with you, not to make you weep, not to make you feel sad for me, but to encourage you. Because if this little anxiety-ridden person can come through such trials, such difficulties as chronic illness, coming out of abusive home when she was a teenager, and the loss of her loved ones, and so many other things, if I can do it, I want to encourage you to know that you can do it. I'm going to repeat myself time and again in saying that trial and tribulation strengthens us. It strengthens our faith. It's iron sharpening iron. We are sword blades in the forge getting hammered on time and time again, but we're being formed and shaped and strengthened for the next battle. And when we emerge from those battles, again we'll go to the forge and we'll be repaired time and time again. And this is for us. This is for our own good. We can't look at these trials and run away from them because we're scared, but we can face them head on with the assurance of things hoped for, the assurance, the knowledge of things not seen, because that's exactly what faith is. It's the substance of things hoped for, the assurance of things unseen. What are those things? They're the promises that God has given us, and we know he fulfills his promises, and he comes through because his own son died for us, took all our sins, and on that cross, he saw us and looked at us with such an infinite and unfathomable love, and he willingly put himself through so much because he loves us, and that was such a huge fulfillment of promise of everlasting life that our Father, our Creator, came to this world and suffered as we suffered, died, rose again after three days, that all who confess Him with their mouths and believe in their hearts that God raised Him from the dead would be saved. And so I just want to encourage you that what you're going through right now, you will get through it. Cling fast to the Lord. Cling to Him. Study your Bible. Pray. Keep on living and the full assurance and knowledge that the Lord will bring you out of this. And because of this and through this, in Him and through Him, you will be stronger. I hope this has encouraged you, and I know that there was sadness in this. I want you to rejoice, because this faith that God has strengthened is going to face more trials and more tribulations but I will rejoice in the Lord my God. I will rejoice in Jesus Christ because I know that no matter what I go through, they are here, right here with me. They will never fail me. They will never let me down. And they will do just that for you. For nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing, not even ourselves. So I want you to take that with you. Take that knowledge, that assurance, and that encouragement with you and have a blessed day. And again, thank you so much for being here with me today. Paleo Tenebris Radio is a production of Fight the Lies Ministries. Visit us at ftlradio.net. This program is released under Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives, 4.0 International License. Intro and outro music by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com.